Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is, let's see, episode 61, recorded on November 13th, 2013. If you'd like to see more of our episodes, you can go to my vid blog at walkinpark.com. All right, so let's get back to normal here. Well, this time we're going to take a look at some uh, uh, invasive species, some insects actually, that are killing major trees in our forests. Um, we're gonna, today we're going to look primarily at one that's killing the hemlock trees. Now this is not the poison hemlock, the herb that, that Socrates drank, I guess, is at the end of his life when he was being uh, executed, but uh, rather the tree that is uh, very common in our gorges. See if I can get a picture of a hemlock tree in our gorges around here somewhere. Well, wait a minute, we'll come up with one eventually here. I can get the twigs. Yeah, here's some twigs. This is hemlock twigs. Anyway, you'll see some in the videos, but uh, this is very common, this tree, in our gorges, and uh, it plays a very important uh, ecological role and protection uh, role in protecting our watersheds. Well, it turns out that this past weekend, there was a little conference in the Six Mile Creek watershed, which is southeast of Ithaca, running from the city out into the town of Ithaca and out into the town of Dryden, I guess and um, other areas. And this is an aerial photo by Bill Hecht of Six Mile Creek. And you can see in the upper right a couple of lakes, ponds, and the farthest one to the upper right is the um, water supply for the city of Ithaca. Now, uh, this was a um, uh, Six Mile Creek watershed program. Oh, I'll read this off. On uh, November 8th and 9th, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network held a two-day conference in the Six Mile Creek Watershed. On Saturday morning, two dozen people met at the Mulholland Wildflower Preserve parking lot on Giles Street in Ithaca for a walk and talk along the creek, learning about the watershed and also particularly what we're going to touch on in this show is the um, uh, whether or not, searching whether or not, there is an infestation of an insect pest that kills hemlock trees in the watershed. Now, it's been found in some other areas like Robert Treeman State Park, Cornell Plantation, Steganic Falls, Watkins Glen, and many other places, this insect. And you'll learn a lot more about it here. But um, we didn't know at this point whether or not it was in the Six Mile Creek watershed. And it's an important question. So. Um, We'll take a look here. And to do that, we'll uh, see what uh, Mark Whitmore, who is a scientist at Cornell, he is a forest entomologist with the um, and the New York Invasive Species Clearinghouse Information Clearinghouse Project, www.nyis.info, if you want to learn more about invasive species in New York. In any case, he met with us out there and uh, we went for a walk and talk. So we're gonna do that right now. We'll go right to the show. And, um, you know, it's just to give you a little perspective, it's sort of, it's been a bucolic profession actually. You know, we go out there, we look at bugs crawling around on trees and trying to figure out the best way to minimize their impact. Uh, and, you know, in the good old days, that was basically to keep them from going outbreak, to keep trees alive. And, you know, it's like it was pretty, it wasn't that difficult. Now we're faced with uh, a very different um, set of rules with these invasive species that have come in recently. Uh, primarily the emerald ash borer and the hemlock lily adelgid, they're game changers. Uh, it's, they kill trees, and they kill them rather rapidly, and we don't really have uh, very many tools to work with because they're so aggressive. Uh, you, you from um, Michigan are very well aware of what's happened, basically. Um, the emerald ash, it's like, and, and please, I, I prefer when you use, when you talk about these things, don't say if. It's when it'll get here. There's just no question about it. Both bugs, they will be here. So don't don't even kid yourself about you know not thinking about it until it arrives. Because mm -hmm. actually, the best thing we can do is start planning well before it does get here, so we can help mitigate the impacts the impacts that you outlined. Um, in the watershed, you know, I think that there 
they can be very dramatic. In this area, the hemlocks occupy a very important ecological role uh, in regards to water quality and maintaining the stability of slopes, perhaps. Um, and think about it. What will come in behind it? What else do we have uh, that, that operates that way? It's like it's very valuable for wildlife in the wintertime. Uh, and we work with very basic soils around here. So I'm not a soil chemist, but I'm a biologist. And I, you know, I can't help but think that the acidity that the hemlocks bring to the soil uh, uh, increases the diversity of the soil microorganisms. And the operational word with biology, in order to have a resilient uh, ecosystem, diversity is one of the major components of that. And diversity in the, in the soil microbes, I think, is important. So you know, not only the fact that it offers habitat, winter habitat to many uh, animal and bird species. So hemlock is, is what we refer to as a keystone species uh, in the ecosystem up here. And if you really want to get scared, go down to the Appalachian Mountains and see what's happened to their hemlocks down there. It's, it's really dramatic to see uh, huge, I mean, huge dead trees uh, over the landscape. Um, and they're working draft very quickly right now to try and save like 1%, 2%. So, you know, it's like um, they got started late and we're sort of lucky on, on both with both bugs because we're the beneficiary of others' uh, uh, experience. Okay. So, um, Mark discussed both the emerald ash borer and the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, the emerald ash borer is not here in Tompkins County yet, but it's in the next county over, Schuyler County. Um, we'll go into that in another show, perhaps with the same uh, you know, report from the same day. And uh, let's take a look as he goes into more depth about the hemlock woolly adelgid, A-D-E-L-G-I-D. -E it's a strange little name, a strange little insect. So let's take a look at what he had to say about that. Hemlock is a different story. Hemlock, it's been a, a wild, uh, how would you say, a wild ride with the hemlock woolly adelgid. It, hemlock woolly adelgid is a little tiny sap sucking uh, bag of protoplasm. <laughs> That's the best I can say it. It's an aphid like thing. It has mouth parts that go into the tree. It injects a hormone into the bark, into the, uh, uh, actually, the, the uh, ray, xylem ray parenchyma cells and make some fat, but that at the same time, and then they eat on that, but at that at the same time, in the twig, the tree has its own defenses, and it's their generic defenses against invasion. You know, you harm a tree with a hatchet or something, it actually walls off that wound. You, you get, uh, uh, you know, a pathogen coming in. The tree has a generic walling off thing. So if you have a million of these little aphids putting their mouth parts into your twigs, you're going to try and wall them off, but at the same time what you're doing is you're disrupting your capacity to transport nutrients along the twigs, and so the needles die, and you get bud die back, and gradually the tree dies. Um, depends on how rapidly the bugs grow. You get warmer climates, like in the southern Appalachians, trees die in four years. It's been up here in the Finger Lakes area for about six years, seven years now, and we're just seeing dieback right now. So it takes a little bit longer up here, but not that long. Uh, and we're actually very similar. When we think about the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, it grows in the winter time. And so when you think about the effect of climate on the hemlock woolly adelgid, you don't think about summertime growing temperatures, you think about wintertime temperatures. And if you look at the wintertime temperatures, we're very similar to the Delaware Water Gap down there in northern New Jersey. Uh, we have the influence of the Ontario Plain. So it's actually in between here and, and the Delaware Water Gap, there's, it's colder. But, you know, it's actually it's his, this Delaware Water Gap is experiencing extreme mortality right now. Uh, six years, trees are dying. And, and actually the manager there um, is sorry that he didn't do more to treat the hemlock trees uh, when he, uh, at, the, at the time. So we have the benefit of his experience. And let's see, where was I? Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Okay, let me rewind. I've sort of painted the picture 
of, of that. Let me look at some of the strategies. Hemoquilia delgid is native to three areas. There are three distinct biotypes. You've got China, <laughs> Japan, and the Pacific Northwest of North America. Okay, three different biotypes. And all those locations, the trees have <laughs> resistance and there's natural enemies. Here in Eastern North America, we have the Japanese biotype that became established in the 50s around Richmond, Virginia, and has spread throughout the eastern seaboard since then. Okay, it got into the Appalachians and it's just wreaked havoc, uh, killing all sorts of trees. So we got it in here in the Finger Lakes just recently, about six or seven years ago. And um, the evolution of the control for this has been, you know, it's, it's always a learning curve. You get it and you think, oh man, what is this? It takes a couple of years to figure out what it is, how it operates, you know, exactly what's going on biologically. And then you're thinking, okay, how do we control it? What do we do? Uh, what is our management strategy? And that takes a couple of years to develop. So, you know, basically we didn't realize it was a problem until it got out of Richmond, the Richmond area and got into the mountains and started really going crazy. So we've really been working on it for maybe the past 15, 20 years. Um, and we've come up with two tactics, I think, that uh, work right now. Um, number one uh, are uh, systemic insecticides. Um, uh, the neonicotinids, you know, the well, reviled class of chemicals uh, uh, that I think is actually an incredibly useful uh, aspect uh, for preserving hemlock. Okay? <laughs> it's a systemic, it gets into the tree, and it protects the tree for up to seven years with one application, which is an amazing tool. There's really very few times you find something as effective as that. And if you're thinking about honeybees, you needn't there are no nectaries on, on hemlock trees. They're all wind pollinated. There's no reason a honeybee would be found anywhere near the hemlock tree. Okay? So, there you go. Uh, the, um, so, that, that is one of the strategies, but that's only a short term strategy. Okay? That keeps basically the big trees alive. And that's what we need. We need to buy time because we need to establish biological controls. And we've been working on biological controls, and we have, I think, uh, one, we need, it's actually, we need a suite of biological controls, but we have one in particular right now that's been very effective. It's from the Pacific Northwest. It's the most common uh, predator in the Pacific Northwest. It's a little tiny beetle called Laracobius nigrinus, and I released about 2,500 of them in the last two days up here. I collected them down in North Carolina. They were introduced into North Carolina about 10 years ago, and they've spread from the initial introduction point about 20 miles away. And this fall, not only myself but others have collected over 11,000 uh, down there. And so they're reproducing very well, uh, and they are affecting control. So there's hope. But what we need to do is we need to buy time for the biological controls to become established. And that's why we have to go out there on the landscape and actually choose our priorities. Where do we put our energy? I think a watershed is a pretty good priority uh, to maintain the integrity of the watershed. State parks, Treeman Park, Teganic Park, they have infestations. Treeman has the most, the longest, uh, uh, longest, the, the oldest infestation around. Um, and it just got into Letchworth Park. But then we also have, you know, beautiful state forests around here, like Michigan Hollow. Uh, I actually just, just uh, Thursday found it in Texas Hollow. And that's a very, very high priority for me because it has an acidic bog in it. Uh, the only acidic bog within miles and miles. And so I actually, I released right there. There were just a couple of trees and hopefully those predators will keep down the population. Um, so treatment in Texas Hollow I think is really difficult, but get, them, get the bugs in there, get the predators in there really early and it might be a viable thing. So there's, there's things to think about. We have tools now, finally, thanks to the work uh, of others in other areas. And um, now we just need to help, I think, be aware of them and to look at what we have in place and decide what to do. Okay. So uh, a lot of information there. The, the next thing that we did is uh, went out looking to see if there was any hemlock woolly adelgida on the eastern hemlock trees, not to be confused with poison hemlock, of course, which is a, an herbaceous plant that uh, uh, was very toxic. This is not. You can actually make a tea from the needles if you want, uh, although it tastes a little like turpentine. In any case, um, 
we went out to see if there was any hemlock woolly adelgid. So let's take a look at that. So yeah, you can see them all over. And it has sort of a lacy appearance to it. Um, you look across the way there, and most of those trees don't pay no attention to the big pines. But the, low, the smaller trees are the hemlocks. On the other side of the stream there, you see how they're sort of leaning over the stream? And you can imagine in the hot part of the day when the sun is, is going over to the west, that actually they provide a heck of a lot of shade on that stream. And they're gonna, that's why people come here to cool off in the summertime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, I've been thrown out by the police up here. Uh, <laughs> but the, you know, it's like that's, that's part of the ecosystem service they provide. They cool the temperatures. And without that cool stream temperatures, we wouldn't have uh, the native brook trout. The native brook trout need to have cool streams for their, to reproduce in. <laughs> But I'd also like to mention that the way the hemlock woolly adelgid gets around, okay, right now, if you wanted to try and start an infestation by grabbing onto a branch with hemlock woolly adelgids on it, it wouldn't work. Not at all. So most of the time, most of the year, you can go around and, you know, get full of hemlock woolly adelgid dust and, and you wouldn't be able to infect any other stands, or infest any other stands. Only when the eggs hatch, Around the end of March, or the beginning of April, when the eggs hatch, the first instar that comes out is what we call a crawler. It's got some, it's actually, you know, it's like, okay, the adult's a millimeter in size. So this is about less than a quarter of a millimeter in size. Teeny tiny little thing. But its legs are actually really operational. It moves really quickly. And if you look at it under a dissecting scope, it seems like it's on a race course. It's amazing. <laughs> But those, you know, they can get blown around by wind, but what are the chances of them getting transported in the wind a long distance? Not, not very good, right? The most, the most important long distance transporter we feel are birds. What they'll do is they'll come in the winter time, around that time of year, they'll come to land on the twig. The crawler is fast, it'll get on their feet. The bird will take off, where will it go? Well, it'll probably take a drink of water. And then it'll go find another hemlock, maybe, and perch on that. Then it'll come off, and boom, there you go. I have what I call the skipping stone theory of population expansion, where it's sort of like I find in areas, just there'll be a population, and then there won't be any around it, and then you'll find another population nearby. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, and that's why I think the birds are so important. But within a spot, the wind just dropping down and infiltrating down, that's how they spread throughout the trees. Um, but here you go. It's like here you have branches right next to a stream. If I was adventurous, I'd walk over there right now and look at those branches because that's where we find infestations starting. Lower down. Mm -hmm. Right next to streams. Yeah. Right, where the birds come, they the get birds. a drink of water, and they go up. So when you're doing a survey, you don't go into the deep part of the woods. You want to stay to the edges where birds might be using the branches. Okay, so um, a little bit more on uh, the ecology of the trees, uh, the hemlock trees, and the how the hemlock woolly adelgid spreads. So it's a um, pretty disastrous organism, and it kills our beautiful hemlock trees. They have value to the watershed and so forth, but they also are what make our gorges beautiful besides the geology themselves of those beautiful trees. So a picture of Treeman there was mostly hemlock trees in it. So let's go see if we found any in the in the Six Mile Creek watershed there. The, up to this point, it was not known. Well, actually looking right here, we'll zoom in a little bit here. Right in the top of the twig there, it's going straight up. You see a lot of little white dots. Well, that is the egg sac and of the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid covered by um, a woolly or a cottony material. Here's one that's not from there. This is a picture of a heavy infestation elsewhere. So this was a confirmation that it's in Six Mile Creek now. It's expected to be there. It's going to be everywhere. There are hemlocks around here. Sooner or later, they're going to uh, they're going to get infested 
with this. So how, what do we do about it? How do we protect so at least some of the trees and protect the, the um, uh, population so they might rebound once you get some of these insects in that can act as biological controls? So we'll take, it another, take another little look at a video from our walk and talk about that. that we have uh, when you when you go out into the woods is you see different age groups of, of trees and um, I always have a special thing in my heart for for large trees and it's not just because they're big and magnificent no I'm too much of a biologist although I grew up in the west coast with huge trees but I finally found the argument that makes sense for me and that's that big trees what do they represent they represent an individual that's stayed and managed to persevere in one place. Trees don't move that much, even though one of my friends likes to refer to them as herds. Uh, but they stay in place and they've survived for years and years and years. There's very valuable genes in that because there's been all sorts of things that have hit that tree over time, but they've survived. You get a young tree, they're untried. And so when you're thinking about reestablishing a forest over a landscape, you want to use the genes that have survived, that are valuable in that place over time, not the little ones. You don't want to go to Kmart and buy a little tree, you know, that came from somewhere else. You want to get the local genotype that's withstood the pressures of time in place. So, when it comes to hemlock woolly adulted, when I approach a stand, I look to the big trees as the future of the stand. And the problem with the hemlock woolly adulges it's like they'll infest all the trees, but the large trees, they oftentimes, they can't sustain an infestation as long as young trees do, because they have a more fragile uh, 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 vascular system. Uh, and so it can be, can be compromised. And so adelgids, when they first move into a stand, they'll take out the oldest trees first. Oh. And so that's why I think it's really important when you're approaching, it's like now, now you have time to plan in the stand. You know you have the adelgid. It's like you've got to think about, okay, what are we going to do? Well, well, here, there's a big dead hemlock there. You want to look at the big ones. Try and preserve those first, and then go to the young ones. Introduce biocontrol, so actually the biocontrol agents, the beetles, have food to eat on the young trees. And then maybe, you know, then monitor and keep introducing insects, keep introducing predators. And so over time, you'll have the populations of the predators built up to the point that you're going to be able to impact the population and return health to the trees. Okay, so um, if you would uh, like to learn more about hemlock woolly, the adelgid, and the emerald ash borer, and many other invasive pests, you can go to a website. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't put it up on the screen, but it's www nyis.info nyis stands for New York Invasive Species Program and um, get a lot more information there and there's some more videos and so forth uh, they're looking for volunteers Cornell Plantations I know has uh, uh, gotten together a lot of volunteers to go over their preserves and find out first of all do these surveys um, get you know get some training do these surveys to uh, determine exactly where the insect has moved so they can start planning how to mitigate the impacts and hopefully have some survival of this tree. So we've got a couple of minutes left here. We're gonna actually go over to the Seneca Lake Valley and take a, a short look at another gorge that most of us have not seen. So let's pop over there. This is an aerial photograph, again, by Bill Hecht and um, looking south towards the village of Watkins Glen and off to the upper right would be Watkins Glen State Park and the gorge there and by the way there's a very heavy infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid in Watkins Glen State Park and the state is uh, working to try to control it so that the biocontrols can eventually at least save some of the trees and we'll have a future there but that's not what I'm talking about here we're looking at the other side of the picture you can see a um, We'll see with the arrows pointing, there is a 
gorge right there that is along the Finger Lakes Trail, but not very many people see it, not very many people are aware of it. Um, and it's called Excelsior Glen, and the Upper Falls, I believe it is, is uh, Excelsior Falls. Now this picture, these next couple of pictures were taken by Deanna Stickler Lorenz. She went on a hike over there. She hadn't been there before. I hadn't been there in years. But um, here's another shot of Excelsior Falls. And then this, I think, is called Emerald Falls. So it's a really pretty spot. It's, uh, you, know, you have to walk in to get to the falls. But the, the um, Finger Lakes Trail, I think, goes around the top of this stuff. So another gorge. I do not know whether the um, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is in there, but if it isn't, it will be soon. I expect it may be. So now we'll pop down into Pennsylvania and look at another gorge. This is the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania, or Pine Creek is the river down there. And it is, uh, let me see, this is a state park that this picture was taken from, Leonard Harrison State Park. This picture was taken by my friend Karen Edelstein uh, last month. And they went down there and explored that. I haven't been down there in years. Probably, uh, I don't know, I expect the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid might very well be in that area, but that's not where what we're talking about today. So, um, Okay, we'll look at a couple of other spots. Let's go up the Adirondacks. Now we're getting away from it. The, uh, this was October 20th, and it's snowing up in the back. The peak in the back there is Mount Marcy, the highest peak in New York State, 5,344 feet above sea level. But before that, in the middle distance, is Mount Colden with its famous rock slides on it. And uh, when I was younger, I hiked up there a whole lot, including climbing up one of those rock slides, I think. Well, actually, I climbed up a what's called a dike to the left of the mountain there. But uh, that's a pretty cool place. So now we're going to pop down to um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And this was obviously in uh, the fall colors were still going. But if you look at the lower left, you'll see a couple of black dots. And that is a um, an adult bear and its cub. So here's another. Let's see. Get uh, Another picture in Great Smoky Mountains. This is a big old oak tree that's turning. And finally, let's go to one more quick video here. This is a uh, video of scenic views around Ithaca. And we'll cue that right up. Ithaca, New York and the beautiful Finger Lakes region is known for its scenic natural beauty. The town of Ithaca, which surrounds the city at the south end of Cayuga Lake, has defined a scenic views driving route around the town. It begins near the southwest corner of the lake on State Route 89, passing waterfalls like this one in Williams Glen. The route zigzags up West Hill with views across the valley toward the eastern slopes above Cayuga Lake, including Cornell. After continuing an exploration of West Hill, the scenic route descends with spectacular views of Inlet Valley. At the bottom, the traveler enters Buttermilk Falls State Park and climbs South Hill on Sandbank Road overlooking Inlet Valley from the east. The route continues across South Hill on West and East King Roads with a side trip northwards to a wayside pull-off on Route 96B, offering a grand view of Cayuga Lake. On East Hill, the route passes a vista of Ithaca College on South Hill and goes through Cornell Plantations and Sapsucker Woods before heading back toward Cayuga Lake on Route 13. The final vista on our route is from the town of Ithaca's East Shore Park. Okay, well, that's it for the show today, episode 61. All right, so see you soon.